outlandish or violate separation of church and state, we'll do a press release or we'll do blog postings about that. Uh, but our primary focus is the lobbying and the grassroots coalition building. Those are the, the key components. When do you guys in the union sector <laughs> well, actually, next year, uh, we, I, I gotta check on the date, but next year, there's gonna be a, uh, it's called the Reason Rally. And, and uh, I, I'm gonna be participating in that, and I don't know, they've got celebrities, which I'm certainly not, who I think are also gonna be participating in that as well. Um, and for me, the, the key for that is I hope, and I think, that the planning is going well, so you have you know, sufficient critical mass of people uh, to attend. Uh, but we really want to bring out you know, kind of uh, celebrity involvement with uh, this effort. And uh, then on our end, really bring out these public policy issues. Like I think, for example, when I was talking about these parsonage issues, that a lot of people, uh, the Joe Six Packs and the soccer moms, that hits them in the pocketbook and it's not right. And when we talk about this little girl dying in this childcare that doesn't have to obey the law or these faith healing deaths, these are things where you can get the average person involved. And that's really how we want to build uh, the movement. I look a lot to the history of the early civil rights and early equal rights for gay people uh, efforts. That we're at a similar uh, place. And for me, the most important part is kind of this foundational organizational uh, effort that in the past has not been done nearly enough and that's exactly my mission in life. Yeah, although I want to make sure I'm doing my numbers right, but go ahead, because uh, you were five. Or... You don't have, I don't remember the exact name, but the Organization for the Separation of Church and State. AU, uh, Americans United, yes. W the definition or the criteria for being in the Secular Coalition for America, which uh, would include any national non-theistic organization. We work beside and along with AU, but they are not non-theistic. Uh, so it has to be any order. I mean, th they're not religious either, but this is expressly on behalf of secular Americans. So we work and lobby side by side. For instance, the Interfaith Alliance is an expressly religious organization. We lobby with them and work with them all the time. We agree with them. Uh, because they take our position on separation of church and state, and that's great. But they wouldn't join our coalition because we're here to represent secular Americans specifically. And if that was five, six. Six is just a uh, plug for the website. I don't belong to many of these things because I don't have the tolerance for spam. It's actually very infrequent. It's only every few weeks that I get a uh, email from this organization. It's usually about some significant legislative issue, so it's not hitting me with something trivial. And it might be something like, not to be too specific because I don't recall the specifics, but like a bill that permits pharmacists not to provide emergency contraceptive uh, to women. And so you can live in a, uh, a community where you don't have a lot of pharmacy options. And if you need someone to get plan B within a 72 hour period, and the three pharmacies in the area just say we will not honor the prescription. Now, that's not the best situation. So they usually are something significant, and it's usually just a click to send a petition to uh, a representative uh, in the U.S. government. And so my feeling is, is that uh, even if I don't expect my local politician to vote one way or the other on an issue based on petitions, I think it's helpful for them to get a flag saying people are aware of this issue and are watching it. And so I'll send something and it's usually just a click to send Charlie Dent to a website something to say, I have feelings about this issue and register. So that's what I do and I, I think it would be better for more people to do it because I find it simple and not intrusive. I'm not getting a lot of spam, solicitation. It's a heads up. It's a significant issue. Would you put your name out on a petition? This is, the, this is exactly what we Yeah, I, I didn't even pay him to say that. But uh, <laughs> secular.org, pretty clear and simple, secular.org. And again, free. It, and if you've got your smartphone, you can do it right while you're sitting there. And then you get those notices. And we do try not to overdo it. We are expanding as, or, as an organization, so we're lobbying more and we're communicating more. But we're not, we don't 
hit people over the head every day. We try to send something out that's substantive. And just since you raised it, I want to give you another example of the human impact of this issue uh, with the pharmacy issue, because it's one that gets me particularly angry. Um, there was a situation of a woman in Arizona. She was raped. She was 20, 21 years old. She was raped. Goes to the hospital after this trauma, and the physician gives her a prescription. And she heads to the pharmacy, and the fundamentalist pharmacist, exercising what is termed the conscience clause, turns this raped woman away. Think about the trauma you've just gone through being raped. Then you go to the pharmacy, and some guy's going to lord over you, if you will, and say, well, get away from me, sinner. I'm not going to fill your prescription. This happened in, in Tucson, in, in Arizona. And there's a state statute. And this is where we let them take our language away. Uh, conscience clause? No, unconscionable. Unconscionable that anyone would not fulfill their professional duties. If you want to be a pharmacist, you either fulfill your professional duties or you should be fired. That's the way I, I see their position. It's just ridiculous. And we need to pass, as there is, at the federal level, a proposal to eliminate that so states can't do that. And uh, that's what I was referring to as one of our 10 principles. And that's, that's one of an extreme example, but it's throughout. You know, A lot of times people, they get taken, for instance, in, in serious situations, taken to Catholic hospitals with uh, Mr. Kevorkian, who apparently turned off the... Uh, you know, <laughs> the Fred Edwards, <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but, but with uh, those kinds of situations, if you, if you have an end of life directive, there have been religious hospitals who have refused to fulfill your express intent. And you don't know about it. You don't know about it. You're sick or you're hit. You're banged on the head, whatever. You don't get a chance to say anything, even though you have a written intent already. Go ahead. specifically to Sacred Heart Hospital here in Allentown, but it serves our poor inner city group. Mm -hmm. They do not have to mention that it's an option available. I've, I've personally right. had patients who have come in to, I work in women's center in Sarah over the treatment that they received at you know, I'd love to hear more, uh, love is the wrong word, but it would be helpful to hear more of those kinds of specific stories because I think they're more persuasive than when we speak in the abstract, and it's really helpful. Uh, and I do, I'm very serious also about the language choice. Like if you hear people say the conscience clause, I always stop them. <laughs> so that's not the conscience clause, and I'm going to tell you what this is. It's a violation of someone's human rights. Don't let them take our language. Uh, one of the things that struck me kind of in reverse that I'd hope we'd sort of reconsider to some degree in, in our movement is I gave a speech one time where I used the word morality and uh, this was at a humanist or atheist meeting actually and someone got up and kind of scolded me and said, morality, how dare you talk about that? We're not about morality. That's their talk, you know. Uh, and I think that's fascinating because when Dr. King or Bobby Kennedy, who were religious people, but when they talked about morality, they were talking about the poor, the dispossessed, including people who were excluded in society. That's what morality meant. The word morality has been stolen to mean, let us get a microscope to intensively uh, you know, examine your genitalia and what you've done with it lately. Um, maybe that's none of our business. That's sort of my thought on those topics, that the, this sort of sexual obsession that is such an undercurrent of uh, extreme fundamentalism in this country is sick. And, and it is corrosive to the word morality. Morality is a lot more noble than uh, you know, your, your, your sex life, which is seemingly w almost a, their primary focus. And so for us, I'd like us to kind of reclaim the language of morality and reclaim the language of justice. And when people use these kind of uh, Orwellian terms, like the conscience clause, let's call them on it. And we can do that at secular dot org. Yeah. Um, that would be a big help to me if you do that. And I'm happy to answer even more questions when we hit, but you want to do one more and then maybe we could go grab a bite. 
Uh, it is called Pitchstone Press out of North Carolina. They're not a big uh, publisher. I'm actually, um, when I go back on the train tonight, I'm trying to go through edits on the next round. It's going to be fun, though, because uh, Richard Dawkins uh, it invited me to be the warm-up act uh, for him when he has his, his book come out in October. And I'll have, I'll have advanced copies of my book in October, and we're going to travel together throughout the whole U.S. Uh, for the entire month of October, and then I think one speaking engagement in early uh, December. So it'll be a real opportunity to talk about privileging of religion in law. I think part of why Richard Dawkins uh, wanted me to do this is that as a British citizen who, uh, and a scientist who's spoken more about whether or not God exists, uh, a topic for which I'm you know, completely unqualified, um, you know, and I'm totally unqualified to talk about science, but that he feels not comfortable as a British citizen talking about American politics and public policy. And so at those events, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of these issues and how we need to change America. And really it's important, uh, I think, for citizens of the world, and I know Richard Dawkins believes this, is that if you're a citizen of Tibet or Iceland or Britain, wherever you're from, the United States just as true is still uh, the most hugely influential nation on earth and unfortunately unlike Western Europe uh, theocracy is you know right at the barricades and potentially coming over them so happy to talk more secular.org pretty please yeah.